My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, it's my custom as a preacher to take the lectionary readings which we have been granted and to seek to explain and interpret and exhort and teach so that we can see even now that God's promises are good. They are good today. They are good for us. They are good in our present circumstances, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. So I'm not picking, you know, verses at my predilection or my preference. I'm not talking about things that... I might feel like talking about or things that seem particularly uh, relevant to me in, in one regard or another, but receiving the wisdom of the church, receiving the tradition which says at this time of year, in this particular year of a cycle, you ought to deal with these things, you ought to hear these words, you ought to be confronted with these scriptures. And so in essence, I kind of can't dodge it and I can't avoid it, I can't pick this stuff that is sort of easy to talk about, or that seems like, oh, this is really God, I got his finger on it today. Nor can we avoid it together, ooh, I don't really want to talk about that. Ugh, I'm not so sure that I like hearing about such and such, but the counsel of God is open to us, and the prayer is that we would be open as well. So we simply take what we are given out of humility and obedience, and hopefully together we can see what the Lord would have for us today within these readings. So again, it's usually my custom to try to take what we've been given and seek to explain and teach and exhort, maybe make reference to the season of the church year or, or something else uh, about what the faith is trying to teach us at this particular time. Uh, but I also want to be able to make those obvious connections to the here and to the now. Things that we might be thinking, things that we might need to hear, frankly things I need to hear. So today is the day that we have moved the feast and celebration of the Ascension from Thursday to its closest Sunday today, this final Sunday within the Easter season. But it's also something else. Happy Thursday. Hey, Mom. Love you. Love you. I have colleagues who, I promise you, they flat refuse to even mention Mother's Day on a Sunday because it is not a church holiday. And to me, that sounds crazy. Why wouldn't we talk about Mother's Day? Isn't everybody else thinking about Mother's Day? Didn't most of us have to kind of figure something out to give our mothers or our wives or our daughters or somebody something? Because, I mean, it's Mother's Day, and if you don't do something, you're kind of in a little bit of trouble. So we're all sort of thinking about it. Why not reference it? Why not mention it? And okay, it might not be a church holiday or holy day, but I mean, if it's not officially, it's got to be about as close as you can get. I mean, think about it for a moment. What are we celebrating other than this sort of exemplification of godly love that God has chosen to give the most precious gift of life? And He's done it through our mother. Mothers who, more often than not, have loved us with a sacrificial love. With a love that has seen us through hard times and scary times and tough times and difficult times. Mothers who have given things up. Mothers who have given up their very lives, their wants, their interests, their needs, what's easy, what's preferable, but done so out of love for their children. I think that's great to celebrate. I think that's wonderful to recognize. Why wouldn't we thank God for the gift of motherhood through which He has chosen to bless the world and to offer new life? And yet I also recognize that Mother's Day can be bittersweet for many. Some have never known the sort of sacrificial love that I have just referenced. Maybe that relationship was strained or difficult, or maybe that relationship barely existed, if at all. There are those of you here, even now, whose memory of that relationship is sweet and bright and good, and yet the acknowledgement that you cannot hold your mother today, or wish her face to face, happy Mother's Day in love, it's not easy. 
and it is hard. And so this can be a bittersweet occasion for us to remember, but I'm convinced even still that through this gift of motherhood, we can rightly thank God for the way that he has chosen to bless our world and to bring about life generation after generation after generation. So again, to all you moms out there, for all of you who are mothers to our children, who are our wives, who are our own mothers, for the gift of motherhood always and everywhere, in the grace and thanks of God, thank you and happy Mother's Day. So, as I've mentioned, it's not just Mother's Day, but here in the church we have moved the feast and celebration of the Ascension, and that might seem like, okay, I mean, I guess, the Ascension, I mean, it ain't no Easter, not as fun as Christmas, I guess we can observe it if you want to, but it doesn't really seem that, that big of a deal, I mean, if anything, isn't it kind of weird to celebrate Jesus leaving? I mean, maybe we can kind of... Yeah, brush that one under the rug a little bit, but the church says no. The church says this is a principal feast of the year. This is a big, big deal, for in the ascension, the resurrection of Christ is now fulfilled, and Christ is crowned in eternal glory. The ascension is the doctrine which we repeat every single Sunday when we say the words of the creed and affirm our faith. For he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is where the resurrection of Christ and the salvation of our own souls and bodies find its fulfillment after the great 40 days of his resurrected life on earth. So let's look back at that for just a second and see why the church says do not ignore this. <laughs> Remember this because it is significant. So first of all, he's been resurrected at Easter, and he is there in all of his glory, both body and soul, united forever. He's there for 40 days and 40 nights before his ascension, and that's kind of a Bible-y sort of number, right? We can think of some other 40 days and 40 nights, can't we? 40 days and 40 nights at Lent. 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. Uh, 40 days and 40 nights in the ark. 40 years in the desert being led to the promise. I mean, this is all kind of working together, right? So 40 days of the resurrected Christ who is there, who can preach, who can teach, who can bless. He even eats with his disciples. And then he ascends into heaven. Pentecost is not here yet. That's next Sunday at the end of 50 days. But here at the 40th day, or rather on Thursday, which we have moved to today, Jesus gives a final commission to his apostles to say, my mission is your commission. My work is now your responsibility. It will now be the church who will preach, who will teach, who will serve, and who will heal. So that resurrected, glorified body and soul united forever of Christ ascends into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. Well, what's the big deal about that? Doctrinally, this is where the rubber meets the road. What happens in Easter finds its fulfillment at the ascension. So think about this for a moment. Now at the ascension, the seat of the right hand of God's glory is basically a shorthand way of saying the Godhead is now reunited fully, finally, and completely, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always and everywhere. So human flesh and a human body is now within the fellowship of the Godhead. Within the essential unity of God Almighty is the body, is the experience, is the life humanity. As Jesus is ascended, what does he take with him but a body? Remember, born of a woman. So Jesus has like cells, and he has bones, and veins, and he has tendons, and Jesus has a heart, and he has eyeballs, and he has a spleen, and all of these things have now been ascended to be in perfect unity, community with the Father. And those experiences of human life 
someone who really knew what it was like to be tired, someone who really knew what it was like to be thirsty and hungry, somebody who really knew what it was like to be happy and to be sad, someone who really knew what it was like to feel and experience pain and loss and suffering with nails driven through his flesh with a feeling of blood flowing down and each breath an agonized gasp, that is now a part of the experience of the Holy Trinity and of God's essential nature. And this happens because of the ascension. Our own experience, our own life, and our own flesh, now within the community of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and forever and always. And so where he goes, we might go. What has happened to him might happen to us, but he goes to prepare a way. He cannot prepare a way if he doesn't go, so this is where he goes. We won't have a way to go unless he prepares it. Ascension says, I may leave you, but, but for a little while. I may leave you, but you are not bereft or alone. I may leave you, but lo, I am with you unto the end of the ages. My own spirit will I give to you, my own spirit to dwell within you and to bind you together as my church and my body. But before we get to that moment, he must first be ascended. He must first prepare that way. So remember again that the hope of the Christian is resurrection. And resurrection is body, candidate spirit. This is not about your immortal soul. This is not about how once you die you can float up into heaven and grow a pair of wings and strum on a harp on a fluffy, fluffy cloud. This is saying that the very grace and power of God says what has happened to Jesus where his body and his soul has been reunited, has been glorified, and will last eternally in perfection, that's what's going to happen to you. He is the first fruit. You are a part of that harvest. And now that very human body with the Godhead, and now Christ himself goes to prepare a way, and now we have a way to follow him. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. <coughs> Thomas says, I don't know how to go where you're going. And Jesus says, follow me. I am now going to be with the Father, now and always, where I go. I'm making a place for you. I'm blazing a trail for you. I'm leading a pathway for you. And I am taking you with me. And that's the ascension. So we extinguish that Paschal candle, which has been lit now for 40 days since the great Easter vigil. We kindled that new fire to say that the light who comes into the world has conquered over death and the grave, and it just burns continually week after week after week. And then sort of ceremonially, I extinguished it to say, we now have to wait if we want to hold him, if we want to touch him, if we want to see him face to face. But we are not alone, and we are not bereft. Next Sunday, we will remember the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and he has promised he is with us, and he has promised that his spirit will be what we need to survive, to thrive, to be united with one another and with him. But in order to do that, in order for us to grow, in order for us to mature, in order for us to serve, he leaves first. It is mission of teaching. It is the mission of preaching. To baptize and make disciples, it is now our job. It is our great commission, his great commandment to love and to serve in his name so that all the world might see and know. I was just reading this the other day and likening the ascension with teaching a child to ride a bike without training wheels. And you can imagine that if you've had a child and, you know, pretty much all of them rely on training wheels for a while and, and, and you take them off and, and then you can almost kind of picture the, you know, the, the kids kind of, uh, and you've got the mother in the back and they're sort of holding on to the back of the seat and, hold on, mom, don't let go. Oh, I won't let go. And then you see, you know, they kind of weeble and they wobble and uh, they either go or they fall, but they cannot learn unless mom lets go. And in essence, saying that 
for the sake of our own maturity, for the sake of our own ability to serve, for the sake of the world, Jesus lets go. The training wheels are off and we weeble and we wobble, but his mission is fulfilled. Which brings me to Mother's Day. Do you like that subtle transition? <laughs> the segue? The, nice, yeah. the gift of motherhood, the desire of what mothers would want on this day. If we recall what I just started my sermon with coming from our gospel reading, coming from John chapter 17. This is happening within a longer discourse within the uh, gospel of John where John is preserving this time at the Last Supper there with his disciples and Jesus has this kind of long last commentary that he gives to his disciples before supper is complete, before he is arrested later that night in the crucifixion, the resurrection, all this kind of stuff. Jesus knows what he's, what's happening and so he wants to teach one last time. And we all know that last words are super important, right? If, if somebody were dying and they said, I just want you to know one last thing, I mean, we would take that so incredibly seriously, right? I mean, even within the confines of the law, what's referred to as a dying declaration recognizes that if somebody knows they're going to die, you can actually take their testimony and it bypasses some of the hearsay law. Because the idea is if you know you're going to die, what you say, you know must be important and it must be true. So Jesus knows what's going to happen and he, he offers his discourse roughly between John chapter 14 and 17 where he is giving this last message to his disciples. When we get to this section in the, be in the beginning of John chapter 17, and Jesus starts praying for his disciples. So they're gathered in the upper room and he is praying for them. We get to our section, verse 20, and it begins like this. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so the world may believe that you have sent me. That Jesus is praying. Is he praying for? He's been praying for his disciples who are there in the room with him. Who is he praying for now? He's praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for all of those who would put their hope and their faith and their trust in him. He's praying for all of those disciples who have heard the good news of who he is and of what he's done and have sought to respond to him in faith. Jesus is praying for all members of the church throughout all time, throughout space, throughout every language and tribe and nation. He is praying for those who will hear the message of the disciples there on the first Pentecost. And he is praying for those who will hear that message from them. And from those people who receive, they will preach and they will touch other lives. And he's praying for them. And those who touch new lives, who touch new lives, who touch new lives, as it branches out through all time, and he is praying for each of us. He's praying for all of those who have yet to be born who will respond to his gospel. He's praying for all of those in every nation throughout history who have heard the good news and responded in hope and in faith. Jesus is praying for each of us when he says these words. And I bring that up because the prayer of Jesus, this high priestly prayer as it's called, for Jesus the high priest over all the church, over all the world, over all time and space. It says, this is what I want out of them. I desire for them to be one. I desire for them to be united in love and in grace. As I and the Father are one, I desire to dwell within them and I desire for them to dwell together. That they might be one. And when they are one, the world will see and the world will know. How will the gospel be preached? Not just by word, but by deed. How will the world know when they can see his church in unity, just as Christ and the Father are one? What in the world does that have to do with Mother's Day? The mother has more than one child. What do they really want for Mother's Day? What can you hear? <laughs> for the love of God, can't you get along? <laughs> just one day. Just, for me, just one day. And, you know, they might throw in something about cleaning the room or whatever. 
You know, the kids go, oh, you know, can we make you breakfast in bed? Or, oh, I make you this card. Or, oh, I want to make you this macaroni necklace. And mom says, can't you please get along? For the love of God, just one and two. <laughs> and that is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. For the love of God. Can we get along? And I mean that not just in the sense of can't we cooperate and be nice to each other and you know show kindness through word and deed, but cannot we dwell in the unity of Christ as his body? You and me and all the folks here, and the Christians across the street, and the Christians across denominations, and the Christians across time and space, those throughout history and other countries and other nations, those who are gathered now, like we've been reading, around the throne of the Lamb offering ceaseless, endless praise. For the love of God, cannot we be united in Christ through His Spirit with one another to treat each other in love, in godly love, in sacrificial love, like our moms would want us to do, like Jesus Himself prayed that we might. That we would stand together in unity and in solidarity, that we would serve one another, that we would care for one another, that we would treat one another well, we would speak to one another in truth and in love and in grace. And what's going to happen when we do that? We're not only going to serve each other faithfully and well, the world's going to see it. They are going to see love and they will know. Jesus himself has promised that's what's going to happen. May it be so. God, may you grant it in my life and in this church. Heavenly Father, that would be our prayer for all Christians now and always. May we be united in the love of God and the love of one another. And for he who loved us first, that we might reflect that faithfully well to him, and we might reflect that faithfully well one to another for the love of God. Can't we get along? We just treat each other nice. Be the body of Christ that this world desperately needs to hear and to see and to know, to love like Jesus, to teach like Jesus, to preach like Jesus, to heal like Jesus. For the love of God. For it is our turn. Our very flesh now united within the essential unity of God and empowered by the Spirit, bound one to another. It is our turn, it is our chance, it is our responsibility, and it is His great commission to us. For the love of God, may we love Him, may we love one another, and the world will see and know. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with all of God's people. Come, Lord Jesus, come.